man, I love this series. I see a church. Uh, I think today I want to talk to you about relationships. Uh, I, th- I think we're going to be, a, uh, not I think, I know that we need to be a church that's, that uh, has a huge value and emphasis on the relationships. Because, you know, the challenge is, is honestly, the larger that something gets, whether that's an organization, uh, being a church, or a business, or a family, or anything, the larger something gets, the, the, the more issues that it has. The larger your family is, the more issues you got. You just have more problems to overcome. Uh, stores are the same way. I mean, we look at, uh, we're here from the Midwest, I look at Walmart. See, the reaction, uh, automatically. But the truth is, if Walmart don't have it, you don't need it. You know what I'm saying? That, that's, that's a God's honest truth. I, I hate going in there, though. I do. Everybody, why? Because it's so big, and it's so, uh, everybody's there. And it's like, ah, and it just drives me nuts a little bit. But the truth is, is like I can get anything under the sun there, and it's usually cheaper than everywhere else, so it's really good for a lot of reasons, and, but it's just too big, it's just too crazy, I'd rather go to Walgreens or wherever the other stores are at. And so the same happens, though, the tendency is, is that whenever something gets large, especially the church, like people have this tendency, and I understand the, just the realness of it, like they want People want to value the relationships. They want to feel like they belong. They want to feel like it's a family. And I get that because this thing was born out of our living room. And, like, we knew everybody because there was only four of us. And one of them was my wife, you know. And it was just really easy to remember everybody's name. And then, like, for, the, like, the first year, you know, we were, like, I don't know how long it was, but we were, like, under 100 people. You know, the average church size in America is 70 people. And at 70 people, that's pretty easy to remember everybody's name. You know, it just, it just is. If you can't remember them all in the first week, by week two, you got it all down. And, and so it's just, people love that. People love that. I love that. But the tendency sometimes is, like, God has an expectation of growth not only on your life, but on his church, too. And healthy things grow. And so whenever, uh, to the, the dangerous mindset that we can get into is whenever we say, I don't want the church to grow. Um, because I like it small. Well, no, no, no. I believe that the the church needs to grow. I want it to be healthy. I want it, um, but it's not about the numbers on Sunday. Honestly, it's not because you know people come in uh, here and I love it. Um, people getting uh, people getting saved. Two people got saved in these seats that you're sitting in just a few minutes ago. It's incredible. Um, every week, this side's excited. You guys are probably need to get saved this experience and. Uh, <laughs> And so, <laughs> but I understand a couple of things is like real life change. It happens in the context of relationships, doesn't it? Like that's where all the stuff, that's where all the junk comes out. That's where stuff gets worked out uh, nonstop. And I just, I believe the real growth happens in relationships. So on your talk notes that you got in there, there's uh, some blanks. And I know that some people just come here and they love to fill in the blanks. And so I'm going to give you some blanks to fill in today because I see a church that grows smaller as it grows larger. I see a church that grows smaller as it grows larger. My prayer is that for you, whenever you, whenever you see Ignite, that you don't see the organization and the overall whatever, I, I pray that you see the family. I pray that you see families. I pray that you see groups. I pray that you see teams. Um, Ignite is not a church that's, that has small groups. Ignite is a church that's made up of small groups. Um, it's not just a church that has small groups, though. Uh, there's different pockets of people that's collected all over this place that is, is all over, um, that serve all over, that meet all over, that get, have common interest or whatever. And so I, th- I just think it's incredible. And I, there's, I believe there's so many people that's just on the outside looking in, but they're going... Man, I just don't know anybody. I can't get plugged in. Because I I want you all to get plugged in because it's really the relationships in life that shape us. As a society, we are connected now more than we ever have been connected before. Um, With the smartphones that we have in our pockets, they're supercomputers. And they can let us know things like, hey, uh, somebody in China did this like 30 seconds ago. 
And we, could, we, we have the whole, we, we live in an age of instant information. And everybody has it, and everybody has taken advantage of this social media thing, and we feel like we're all connected, and we are on some level more than ever before. But I believe that, as a, that we are more isolated, honestly. I know that we're more isolated than we've ever been before. As Americans, we participate in more socially isolating activities than any other nation on the planet. You say, what does that mean to participate in socially isolating activities? And that's basically, it, it's simple. It's, you can check it out next time you're at a restaurant. Like we gather together to have a meal and we're constantly on our phones. Like you'll see the, the families will sit down at the dinner table and they'll be on the phones, including kids. Like who do they have to call? Like nobody. They don't know anybody. But everybody's just down on their phones. It, it's, it's crazy. So this event that we gather around, is supposed to, although we're together, we're socially isolating ourselves. Uh, another area would be, uh, I know football season's coming up, and, and guys, I'm, I'm excited as you are about it, but that's a socially isolating event sometimes because what will happen is we will... We will invite all of our buddies, and we all want to be a part of this thing, and so we'll come over, and everybody will bring their favorite little, little weenies, and they'll get the cheese dip and all this kind of stuff, and we all stare at a TV and not talk to each other. And if we talk, it's always, I mean, we're, we're sitting there arguing about grown men in tights, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's awkward. Um, I, I love it too, and I'm just speaking from guys' perspective. I can only imagine why you girls get together for things, but the guys would be like, I need to spend time with my boys, and so, like, let's invite, let's everybody get together, go to a movie, so we can spend time together. That's the dumbest thing ever. Like, because we all go, we spend a ton of money, and we, and we go in, and we're like high five, and like that ends when you get the popcorn because you go into the theater, you're staring up to the screen, and they tell you to shut up. It says, put up your phones, stare at Tom Cruise, whatever you got to do, but don't talk to your buddy. And we walk out of the theater, we high five, says, man, it was great spending time with you. I didn't really spend any time with you. I spent time with a movie screen. But we love to engage in socially isolating events. We really like gathering around things that are really relational barriers in our life. Stats show that whenever we live isolated lives, we are more, more likely to get sick Physically, we're more likely to die earlier, and we're more likely to be depressed than people who are not socially isolated. And so um, we need, I think you would agree, we need relationships. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 puts it like this. It says, this is the case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother. Yet he works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. Then he, then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It's all so meaningless and depressing. Listen, there was no joy in his wealth or his life. I want to help you today, hopefully, to see that you need relationships in your life. You need meaningful relationships in your life. And I understand that we can go through life and, and listen it's so easy, like we want, we know what we need, we know what we should do, and it's so easy to hear something like this, it's like, yeah, but you don't understand. And so we, we have these excuses or reasons as to why we don't get plugged in or we don't get engaged, especially in the church world. And so I just want to go ahead and address a, a few of those. There's three reasons that we tend to avoid relationships. The first one's this, if you're taking notes, I don't need them. I don't need them. We feel like that. Sometimes that we just don't need them. Uh, one of the most famous fighters in history, his name is Muhammad Ali. And uh, he was a really good fighter, but he was probably the world's greatest of all time at running his mouth. Like, he was just great. He was awesome for reporters because he'd always give them, like, the best blurbs out there possible. But there's a story that Muhammad Ali was on an airplane one time. Uh, getting ready to go somewhere, and the flight attendant comes by and says, Sir, she doesn't know who he is, she doesn't care who he is, whatever. Says, Sir, I need you to buckle up your seatbelt so we can take off in the plane. And he looks at her and says, I'm going to do it. Superman don't need no seatbelt. She goes, You're right, Superman don't need no airplane either, so put on your seatbelt. You know? 
And so she got him like that. Sometimes we think that we're Superman and we don't need relationships. Like, I can do this. I got this on my own. And we're setting ourselves up for failure. Honestly, we're approaching that from, from a, a skewed perspective. And it's actually a, a lie. Um, some of you honestly say, yeah, but you don't understand. I'm just not wired that way. I know that we, just to get uh, how we're wired down in two basic forms, it's, you know, we got introverts and extroverts. And some people that are introverts, they just say, you know, I just, I don't really need that. I'm kind of better on my own and all this kind of stuff. And so what happens is they don't, they're, they're not socially available. They don't like to put themselves out there. And so it makes it difficult to develop any meaningful relationships. Extroverts, on the other hand, they are, whoo, I mean, they're happy, man. They are charged up whenever they're around other people. But the danger of extroverts are is that they're usually around so many people that they never have time to develop any meaningful relationships. Usually the most extroverted people are the most lonely people on the planet because they're just around things and they're not in involved with things and people. And so there's a danger on both sides. And we're called, the Bible calls us, as, if you're a Christian, we're called to become overcomers. That's what we are called to do. We're going to have challenges in our life, but we're called to overcome those things. We need meaningful relationships. And to say that you don't need them, that's the number one excuse. The number two is, I'm afraid of weird Christians. <laughs> I'm afraid of weird Christians. I think this is the most valid point, all right? <laughs> because this is the one that I would be like, that I used to live in. Like, woo, they're strange people. Can I just tell you, church people sometimes just flat out weird? This is weird, man. Let me tell you, whenever I, oh, I think what happens whenever you hear a message like this and you're kind of new and you're like thinking about plugging in, you're like, I just, I don't know. They're so weird. And you don't even know these people, really. But you're just scared of what could be. So I think you sit at home sometimes and just fantasize about what small groups really are like. And you're like, I bet I know what it's like. I bet, I bet it's like an AA meeting where they all circle up. And I bet that they have this one chair in the middle. And I bet that chair's for me. And they're going to, like, try to cast out demons. And they're going to break out snakes and Kool-Aid and stuff like that. I ain't doing it. I'm just, they're just weird. <laughs> and it, those issues like ha, have kept you out. The, I mean, that's not really what happens. It's only happened here like a handful of times, all right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, uh, hey, what I will say about the small groups that take place at Ignite, that we train the leaders. And, you know, to say that we, listen, we all have issues. Look down, uh, look to the person next to you and look at the people around you. Just just know that you're surrounded by people with issues. Those people that you're looking at have issues. And if you look down your road and say, oh, there really ain't nobody in this road that has any issues, it's because you're the issue, you know. <laughs> Everybody else is looking at you going, thank God he's here today. <laughs> and so <laughs> everybody has issues. I tell you, what happens if you will get past all this and you will actually plug into small groups and you'll dive in just a little bit, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to have, you're, I believe you will be um, refreshed to know you, one day you'll realize that when you really dig in, you're going to experience the Me Too phenomenon. And let me tell you about the Me Too phenomenon. So you're going to get in a group of people where, uh, like, listen, all sorts of uh, small groups, they meet around all sorts of things. We've got small, I got guys right now that they're going to start small groups based around fantasy football. They're like, can I do that? I was like, yeah, great, do it, whatever. So you got all these groups that are meeting for various reasons, from Bible studies to fantasy football and all this kind of stuff. And, and so, uh, but, you know, we, we train them, like, you have to have some spiritual component to it. Like, we need to, these people are there, we need to work out real issues, and, and I charge the leaders with praying for them every day. And so what's going to happen inevitably is you're going to get into a group, and, and you're going to be like, well, that was kind of cool. That was kind of cool. Um, the first couple of weeks, it's going to be like an awkward junior high dance, though. I mean, it's just weird, guys on this side, you know, whatever, you know, it's just awkward. You don't even know how to dance around each other. And then whenever you do, it's kind of messy, and you step on each other's toes and stuff like that. And it's, it's all good, though. By week three or four, there's going to be this time that the small group leader is going to be like, oh, yeah, maybe we should talk about Jesus at some point. And so we need to get on there. I'm just kidding. It should all revolve around Jesus. But at the end, they're going to say, can I pray for you for anything? And you know what? There's going to be a brave soul in there. 
that's going to say, you know what, it's been a couple of weeks. I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there. And be like, you know, you know, old Bobby steps up and he's, says, yeah, I got, I got something that I need you to pray for me about. Yeah, what's that? It's, well, sometimes whenever I, I, I come home from a long day at work, um, my, my wife, she has cats in the house. And, and if I see a cat, I, I, I have to kick it. Like, I, I just have, a, have to kick a cat. And, and, she, and everybody's like, kind of appalled at first, like, oh my gosh, you kick cats. But then everybody starts experiencing the Me Too phenomenon. And they'll go, Me Too, bro. And I'm just kidding, but you know what I'm saying? Like what happens is people will start unpacking a little bit of issues and you'll realize that you're not alone. You'll realize that you're not alone in your issues. That Lots of people struggle with this kind of stuff and we're not there to tear each other down. We're actually there to help each other work their issues out and to lift each other up. And so I think you'll experience the Me Too phenomenon if you'll just dive in and get over the fact that Christians are weird. They just are. Some of them are just strange. I've met you. You're just different. I mean, look at me. I'm like the poster child for weird. The third thing, third excuse is simply this. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I don't use this word lightly, but this week has been nothing short of psychotic in my life. It's just been a nutty week. So I knew I knew that I was going to be teaching the, the next message up in this series. is going to be teaching on relationships. And listen, I need, I, I block off times during the week to where I work on messages and prepare and like just fine tune some stuff. And, and uh, so every time that I had a, a section blocked off, something would come up. So like this week, we, we just wrapped up. It was an incredible 21 days of prayer that we just had. And it was amazing. But let, me and my wife, we decided a long time ago that we were going to build a house out in the boonies. And so it takes us a long time to get up here. And so we have to literally leave the house like 5.30 in the morning or something to get up here. And so, like, I'm, praise God for all you early risers and blah, blah, blah. That's not me. You know what I'm saying? And so I get up out of bed and I look like a bad dream. You know what I'm saying? It's just, eh. Like I'm, and so listen, I'm doing shots of coffee like I'm at a frat party. It's just nuts, and I'm just caffeine after caffeine after caffeine. And, and so by the time I even get up here, I'm just ticking, and so you know I got this one eyelid just nonstop, and it's crazy. And so I'm a little bit on edge, and, and so we're praying through it. And I'm like Jesus, I would love to be able to concentrate on you right now, but I'm just. Anyways, we get through prayer. It's incredible. I love hearing the stories about how Jesus is showing up in people's lives, and the breakthroughs are coming left and right. And then I'm like, I need to have some time to withdraw. I need to go, you know, into the office or into a conference room or whatever. I need some time to study, and so I'll go in there. It's always something. Somebody, I mean, just constantly this week. Like somebody needed something, that's fine. You know, great, how can I help you? All this kind of stuff. Somebody would swing by, somebody would call. I'd turn off my phone, they'd call Tim's asking for me, and it's good, and, and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, I need to get out of here. Let, let's, go, let's go eat, or let's go to a store, or whatever. I go to a store, I see more people I know. I'm just like, ah! And then I'm like, I gotta go home. I gotta go home. So I get home, people are in my house every night this week. Just every night. Uh, honestly, I got some great friends, and they, I love having people over or whatever. But I'm like, I gotta have some time. I, I just need some time to decompress. I gotta, I gotta speak about relationships, and so all these people come over to my house and stuff. And and like Friday night, I'm like, I, look, you, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here anymore. You gotta go. You gotta get out of my house and all this. And they're like, you all right? I'm like, I love you, but leave. And and then so like yesterday, we come up for a prayer. And I, I just told my wife on the way up, she's like, are you all right? I'm like, it's just the caffeine, you know, it's just, I need some time to myself today. She's like, all right, well, after prayer, we're going to go home and then we'll, I'll, you just lock yourself in your office at home and everything's going to be great and you're going to have all this time. I was like, sweet. And so like, I get home, I'm just like, finally got home because we had to make a pit stop at the in-laws on the way there. Like, oh, we, we just need to pick up one of my kids and it ended up turning into an hour Listen, you've never experienced my in-laws, but I'm going to move on for now. And, and so I get up to the house, but it's like, perfect, perfect, perfect. Get in the door. I don't even know what we had. Had something that I had put something in the refrigerator. So I open up the refrigerator. I'm like, ah! My, one of my children, they're my offspring. They had whatever, for whatever reason, taken like a half gallon of grape juice. 
and needed more room for it. And so they took the grape juice, sets up like that, and they turned it over like this. And the lid's not quite on, right? And it was on the top shelf. Oh my God, three hours of pulling everything out. I don't know who makes Samsung refrigerators, but they need to be reprimanded because there's no way to clean these things easily. We're like trying to take it apart. I'm breaking things in the process, cracking the plastic. I'm having an awesome day at this point. And I'm just like, ah, and then more people show up. Oh my God, don't you understand that I have to go tell the church how in important relationships are tomorrow. Get these people out of my life. (laughs) I say that to say, we're all busy. We're just busy. We're busy people sometimes. It's just, we need relationships. But we we need meaningful relationships. Check this out. First Peter, um, chapter four, Peter says, the end of the world's coming soon. That's, That's a good way to start a conversation. The end of the world's coming soon. It says, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. It says, most, of, most important of all. So check this out. If you have a, have a conversation that's going, look, the end of the world's coming very soon. <laughs> I need you to do a couple things. But most important of all, like you, if there's ever a spot, like all the Bible's important, but this is like a really important part. He's saying, because everything is going to come to an end. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love, it, it covers a multitude of sins. Can I tell you, you got sins in your life you need covered for? You just, you, it happens with love. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a place, or a meal or a place to stay. Love covers a multitude of sins. It's just, you gotta deeply love and care for one another. Whenever you deeply love and care for one another, uh, it does a couple of things. Jesus said, first of all, the world's gonna know that you belong to me by how you love each other. And, and it also, like, it helps us get over, when you love somebody, you can look past things. I cannot tell you the amount of stuff that my, my, that my beautiful wife has to look past with me. I have children, four of them. Don't know what we were thinking. I know what we were thinking at the time. Um, but <laughs> I love every one of them. And listen, can I just tell you, there's some days I'm like, Who are you? Like, where did you come from? Um, I, like, I get upset, like, whenever you open up the refrigerator and that happens. And you, you know what's never entered my mind? I won't say ever entered my mind, but I'll say that. You know what's never happened? I've never walked up to one of my kids and go, you know what? It's just over. It's just over. You're out. You're done. <laughs> you, you're out. But listen, we'll do this to other acquaintances in our life and friendships because we've never developed them to the point that we love them. It's too easy for us, and we want to keep people at arm's distance, at arm's length, just because if you get close to them, then you end up loving them, then breaking up's not so easy to do anymore. And it's crazy how disposable our relationships have become in our life. I, I think you, you, need people that, you need people close enough to you that you can love them because whenever you find out some junk on them or they find out some junk on you that you don't have to worry about them running for the hills because they know you're not going to run. Because you love. Because love covers a multitude of sins. So I've got four commitments that I really think that, that you guys need to commit to. Maybe, maybe you need to commit to all four of them. Or maybe just one or two of them is for you. But here's some commitments. A large church becomes smaller when I, number one, invest heavily in my important relationships. Invest heavily in my important relationships. You know that some relationships are just more important than each other? And I know it's not very popular these days to say things like that, like where we feel like everybody should be equal and whatever it is, but there's just some relationships that are more important than others. And your relationships in your life never stay idle. They're either moving forward or they are moving backwards. If you're not maintaining your relationships, you're not investing heavily in your relationships, they are moving backwards. My relationship with my wife is more important than my relationship with you. My relationship with my kids is a more important relationship than my relationship with you. I mean, it's just fair to say. Jesus never said that he was fair about anything. He said he loved everybody, but he had different amounts of love for people. 
It said that he loved the world, but he had, do you realize he had 70 people following him around all the time? 70. We want to focus on the 12, because it was 12 disciples. So he had his 12. So he had the world, then he had the 70, then he had the 12, and within the 12, he had the three that was his inner circle, and within that inner circle, he had one that he actually really loved deeply. So there's just different levels of relationship. The, the important relationships in your life, because you have important re- relationships, you need to invest heavily in them. I got guys that I mentor that come in. I'll meet with a few different guys every now and then. And we can talk about anything under the sun, but the one thing that I always ask them if they're married is, how's your wife? How's your wife doing? Oh, man, good. Yeah, yeah, everything is good. Whatever. Cool, tell me about your last date with your wife. Well, my, 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 my last date, I don't, man, it's, you know, some guys are regularly dating their wives. I always ask them, are you dating your wife? Are you maintaining that relationship? I say, well, you know, I, I dated her until I married her. And then we don't really date anymore. Like, I told her I love her. If I change my mind, I'll let her know, you know. It's like, I was like, that doesn't work that way. You have got to maintain and invest heavily in, into the important relationships. You know, it's, uh, I think that too many people, they, they'll invest more time in their coworkers than they will their family. Say, well, I, yeah, that, that might be true. It's scary. You know, you got to, you got to do the basic things. People say, if they are struggling in their marriage, I'll say, well, are you dating her? When's the last time you bought her flowers? What does that have to do with anything, pastor? You know, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it's the most simple things. We'll look for some elaborate fix and issue when it's the simple things in life. So I was fishing this one time. I'm not a fisherman. I know I bragged a while back about going and being a shark fisherman or whatever. Can I just tell you, I wasn't a shark fisherman. I was a shark catcher. Like somebody else rigged up the pole, somebody else did the bait, somebody else did all the work, somebody else actually hooked it. I, like, I was just standing there. I was like, heck yeah, I'm bragging about this. <sighs> so I had a friend one time that was an actual fisherman, though. He wanted to take me out fishing. And I realized, I, I, here's what I've learned. I'm, I, just, I hate fishing. I just hate it. I'm no good at it. I like to catch. I don't like to fish. And so he's like, oh, man, it's really easy. It's just it, mm, go out and catch catfish. It's like, it's really easy. You just put the bait on the hook and blah, 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 and you set it on the bottom, and the catfish come up and eat it, and you yank them. And, ah, oh, sweet. Sounds awesome. Whatever, dude. I'll go hang out with you. So we get out there. He's got two poles. He says, I got all the stuff for you. I was like, you're awesome. So you get out there, and, and I'm just, he says, just watch what I do. Okay. So I see him. He baits up his hook and all this kind of stuff. He's got some weight on it, and throws it out there, just sitting there. I was like, sweet. And I'm like, throw it out there. I'm like five foot apart from him. Like two minutes later, he's pulling in a fish. I was like, awesome. I'm excited. I'm like, I want to see one of these ugly things. And like he pulls it out and all this. He he throws it somewhere. He baits up another hook and throws it out there. Catches another one. I'm like, yay. This is, Yay. Third one, bam, hooks it. I'm mad at this point. I'm just like, what's up, bro? I was like, do I need to pull it in? Do I need to do, no, 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 just let it sit there. And so this happens like five times, and I'm furious. I'm just mad. I'm saying, I didn't even know Jesus at the time. I'm saying things I should have never said, and I'm throwing things. I'm just upset. I'm mad. I'm like, why? Because whenever, here's what I've learned in life. Whenever things don't work out for us, we get mad at other people whenever they're working out for them instead of wondering what's going on with us. I'm like, He's like, the technique, because I was like, I'm doing the technique wrong. I'm doing something. It's like, he's like, there's no technique. And so he helps me pull in the dill, and you know what? I, I forgot to bait the hook. <laughs> I'd watch it. I did everything else right. But the most simple, stupid step, I just didn't do it. So sometimes whenever, if, is your, if your relationship's not working out all that well, then I wonder, have you baited your hook? Have you done the simple things? Because I, I know you want all these elaborate fixes, but are you, doing the, are you dating your spouse? Are you keeping your, uh, how's, if it was just based strictly on time, if I could look at your relationship b- strict, basically on the amount of time that you spent with this person, how's your relationship with God looking? 
Some of you, you actually, and you got priorities out of whack, and so you got, you got, you put, you elevate your kids in front of your spouse. Women are really good at elevating their kids in front of their husband. You know what? It's different in my house. Like, I, I got one princess, I got three princes. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I got one queen. And the princess and the princes know that the queen is above them. That's daddy's queen. Right there. I'm going to go spend time with my queen. If I hear that door handle jiggle. <laughs> and I will stomp on your fingers if they come underneath that door. I'll spend some time with the queen. I will beat you when I get out in Jesus' name. In Jesus, if you say it in Jesus' name, it makes it okay at the end, you know. <laughs> but I was like, man, she was here first. Y'all wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her, all right? Leave us alone. Get a job. Do something. <laughs> I love it. Ephesians 4 says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort. Turn to your neighbor and say that with me. Make every effort. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Listen, guys, it's going to take work, but I want you to make every effort to be united. Think of a name or two. Like, I, some of you are thinking, like, right now, my, my priorities are out of whack. I need to invest heavily in some, in some relationships that matter. The second thing I need you to do, write those names down, though, you know. Second thing is restore broken relationships. Restore some broken relationships. Listen, not all relationships can be restored, though. But some can. And you should make every single effort possible to do that. Because I promise you one thing. The, the pain of unresolved conflict is greater than the pain of resolving it. <coughs> Romans 12 says, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never ever take revenge. Do all that you can. Let me ask you this question. Are you doing all that you can to restore some relationships? Sometimes it's as simple as an apology. Listen, you need to go and ask for forgiveness, and it's not to set them free. It's to set you free. You know what? If they don't say, well, they won't take it, you don't know that. If they don't take it, big deal. You're free. Not every relationship can be restored, which brings me to my number three is sever the harmful relationships. Sever the harmful relationships. Some of you are involved in relationships that are just heading simply down the wrong road. Maybe for some of you it's the inappropriate relationship. Maybe you're married, but you're having some feelings about some other people. Maybe it hadn't went there yet, but you're emotionally cheating on your spouse. You need to sever those relationships. Maybe for some of you, um, girls, you've been hurt in the past by guys or whatever, but you... And, and you know the pain that comes with that, but for whatever reason, it hadn't stopped you from shacking up with your current boyfriend. And he's taking advantage of you. I don't care if he's sitting next to you right now. You know, I, you need to sever that relationship because he doesn't love you enough to marry you. And some people, always people get mad at that. I'm like, bro, let's talk about it in the lobby, me and you. Because it's the truth. You need to sever harmful relationships. It's toxic. Some of you are just hanging out with the wrong crowd, man. Like, seriously, you'll come into church, and, and you'll feel good, and you'll get pumped up, and there's a lot of good things. Maybe you're even serving on teams at church that, that it's really healthy for you, and you're getting involved and plugged in. But there's this other group of friends that are going totally the opposite way you are. You do not have the same values in life, and it's toxic. You need to sever those. Listen, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm as evangelistic of a person as you will ever meet. I believe everybody can be reached. But the problem is, is that it's way easier for them to pull you down than it is for you to pull them up. And if you could have reached them, you would have reached them. So you need to sever that instead of you being stuck in an unhealthy relationship. relationship. The fourth thing, I'm going to skip down to the fourth thing, is you need to initiate some meaningful relationships. Initiate some meaningful relationships. As, as your pastor, if I am your pastor, um, one of the greatest joys of my life, one of, one of the things I love to see is, is not you walking in and going, wow, I really love Ignite because of 
Sunday mornings, and it's the, it's the worship, and the worship is incredible, and I love it. It's an incredible kids area. There's like three of you that says the preaching is actually good, and, and it's just, like, that's not the win for me as to why. I want you to be able to look at Ignite and go, you know what? That's where my family's at. <laughs> that's where my roots go deep. That's where my boys are at. That's where my posse's at. That's where these people that I can do life with. I know some of my junk. I know some of theirs. We're working it out. Iron sharpens iron. That's where I'm growing. That's the win that I see. Listen to me. Small groups. Small groups are the places where you're going to grow. We are not a church that just does small groups. We are a church that's made up of small groups. That's, I understand. There's going to be people, and there's always a percentage. That's fine. I'm not, it's no guilt trip. I understand that some of you, you just like coming to church because you, you just do. I mean, it's just Sunday mornings, though. You don't want to get involved. You don't want to, don't want to do these other things. I understand. But I will promise you this, is that you will never reach your full potential in Christ until you get involved in meaningful relationships with people in the body of Christ. And you're making a difference on a team, changing the world. And so that is totally up to you. But some of you, I believe that you're just so isolated that you're starving for some relationships. And all we can do is provide the avenues for you. I pray that you don't just come to church, that you get involved in church and you be everything that God had in mind when he created you in your mother's womb. And so... I believe that here we have the path and the systems for you to take to make that happen. And small groups is one of them. And they do launch in a a couple weeks. The directory is coming out next Sunday. So I think that you need to really get excited and think about ways that you would love to get involved. Because it's coming. Because you need those relationships in your life. Let's get out of here before we do. Let me pray for you.